Okay, hello. Then um, we're going to talk a bit about location and location models. Um, and I have chosen two, two different uh, approaches. One is uh, Weber's location model and the other one is, uh, is Hotelling's location model. So there are different ways of, uh, of let's say, considering this, uh, this problem. Uh, location is important. As we have seen, it affects uh, regional uh, development activities that we can attract to a region and uh, the economic activity level in general. And it's, it's therefore useful to have <coughs> a, uh, at least a brief understanding about how location can be affected by, by transport systems and also what types of forces are at work when we, when we talk about uh, location behavior. Um, the first one, Weber's theory, okay, we can take this one first. Uh, this is in a way independent of these two theories, but um, there are <coughs> three, let's say, main categories of factors that affects location. Uh, <coughs> one is accessibility, and then accessibility to different uh, types of, uh, let's say, production factors. Labor is one of them. Uh, the suppliers <coughs> that you need for, uh, for, let's say, if you run a, a manufacturing firms, and also the market, the size of the market, and the accessibility to the market. And uh, <coughs> it's easy to see that, that, that transport infrastructure is, is, a, is a part of this picture to, let's say, provide services that can, uh, can uh, let's say, improve accessibility. But then we have <coughs> site-specific uh, characteristics, uh, which is about uh, land, and public utilities, which is uh, about, could be about uh, services like this, university colleges, uh, schools, uh, other types of uh, public services, infrastructure, uh, <coughs> transportation infrastructure is a part of that, but, but uh, it's also about other types of infrastructure that is, uh, let's say, constitutes the quality of a given site. Something as simple as access to, let's say, cultural experiences, theaters, theaters and th things like that is also uh, elements that constitutes the <coughs> quality of a given site. Visibility, transportation, and so on. And then <coughs> we have the, the socioeconomic environment, which is what we might call external factors that, uh, let's say, together with the more nature-given, uh, especially the land and the, and the quality connected to the, na to the natural facilities of the site. There are also kind of <coughs> constraints with respect to the, the possibility of doing economic activities. You cannot develop a port without having access to the sea and so on. Uh, <coughs> so there are certain, uh, certain constraints embedded here. But here we have the, the constraints more connected to, let's say, policies, public policies connected to taxation, subsidization, regulations, uh, which can be, the regulation can be on a regional level, national level, or even on the international level. Um, 
the availability of technology, which is often driven by, by let's say, external factors, not so much on the, on the regional level. <coughs> and the same with capital. Capital is a is a often very necessary resource to use in in production, um, but it's not in nature uh, something that we can uh, let's say limit to just being a regional resource. It's national and even international. Capital flows are are quite uh, strong and not very distance dependent. Um, but as we shall discuss towards the end of the course, capital availability in projects that could be, let's say, embedded with a certain amount of risk. There are studies showing that local re capital resources that are able to understand the nature of the local industry, and especially if that local industry has certain types of risks connected to its activities, are better, uh, better able to judge that risk and to perhaps, in some cases at least, be able to support the local industry with capital. So there may be a certain information asymmetry between, let's say, global capital sources and the local capital sources, which may come in favor of the local industry. Uh, but we'll come back to that when we talk about Porter's cluster theory uh, towards the end of the course. But as you see, there is there is uh, there are three basic location fact groups of location factors that we can assess in when we are going to make location decisions. Yep. The the land use costs. Yeah. I would say that <coughs> the land use costs are here. We we'll talk about site specific uh, site specific uh, let's say assets, but there is of course inter or interconnections here between the groups because. If you improve accessibility to a region, that could cause the land use costs to increase. Uh, if if you have favorable conditions here, which uh, which can foster a stronger growth in the local industry, that will also affect, let's say, the land use costs. So there are there are uh, interconnections between these groups as well. When we <coughs> turn to Weber, the Weber location theory, this is uh, this theory roots back to 1909. So it's quite old in in over 100 years old. Was made or formalized by Alfred Weber, Weber German economist, sociologist, philosopher. Um, lived from 1868 to 1958. Have any of you heard of Max Weber? The guy with the bureauc bureaucracy theory? That was his brother. So um, I think those guys had quite interesting discussions 
about things. Um, <coughs> it's, it's very simple at the outset. It's, it's based more or less on, on transport costs and optimization. And you can also include labor costs in this, uh, in this framework. Um, but it's, uh, <coughs> it's based on quite simple, simplistic, perhaps, uh, assumptions, which reminds us of the assumptions behind, uh, let's say, a traditional uh, competitive economy. We have profit maximizing enterprises, utility maximizing consumers. Um, <coughs> for simplicity, the enterprise that we study is located at one single point in the geographic space. But it's not the problem to extend the model to, to, uh, to comprise more than one location. Then we simply treat them as different firms in practice. You can consider one firm to, to consist of different branches or departments. And, uh, and in when we use this theory, you can simply consider them as, as different, different entities. So <coughs> we, we try to just, uh, we just observe that production of commodities demand certain amount of supplies physical supplies. This was before the uh, information and communication technology came around, of course, in 1909, when we talk about commodities that are where the production is kind of the movement of info or movement of information flows. Then we have a slightly different story, which I will also comment briefly upon. But you have two <coughs> supplying goods and one finished goods. We talk about this, we call this often a Weberian triangle. Two supplying sources of supplies and one uh, market location where we have, where we have the market. So <coughs> the, the production function is, can we just formulate like this, that uh, the output is uh, it's a function of, of the inputs, be it capital, labor. Uh, but capital is a bit difficult because it's, uh, it's not dependent on physical transport costs. So normally we consider physical goods like we will see here, steel, plastic, whatever physical good that you can, can need in a, in, a, in a production process. And we, f again, for simplicity to illustrate the principle, we can assume that the quantity of output is, is equal to the sum of the inputs. There are uh, also a couple of other assumptions. Um, the transport costs vary with distance and nothing else in Weber's original work. So the transport cost between A and B is only dependent on the distance. But <coughs> if we want to play around with probabilities and uh, transport time variances in the transport from A to B, it's no problem to extend this framework to encompass that as well. And one example of uh, such travel time variance is, uh, is congestion. So if you are going to, and it's, it's, it's really a, a matter of systemize, to, to make a systematic assessment based on very, very simple common sense, right? So if you're going to locate yourself and you can choose um, 
between uh, being dependent on a supplier which has a very high variance in the in the transport lead times and you can choose or you need or let's say that you need to use two suppliers one with a very high uncertainty connected to the transport lead time and on the other one which doesn't have that problem problem with variation in lead time you might want to locate closer to the supplier that has this lead time uncertainty connected to its to, to avoid or to shorten the transport distance as soon as or, or as much as possible given that you also need to take the distance to the other supplier into consideration. That is, I mean, if you if you are lo trying to locate yourself somewhere in the area around the main or a bigger city with congestion problems, you you would perhaps like to to locate in a in a in a way that you can avoid this lead time uncertainty. So it's not a problem to extend the framework to encompass that as well. Um, <coughs> so, we produce the supplies in these two spaces, M1, M2, and we sell the finished good in M3. Um, and again, we are back to the classical assumption of the competitive markets, that the producers and the consumers are price takers. Meaning that the prices of the output and um, the different inputs are independent of the, of the production volume. Because if if those that relation is not in not independent on volume, then the out the the increase or the change in in output and the demand for inputs can affect the prices, and then the problem becomes much more, let's say, messy to 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 compute. Because you get a lot of uh, of interrelations between the, the factor prices and the distances and the volumes. And even with today's resources when it comes to, to computing, it can quite soon become at least uh, actually unsolvable problems. And in, in, in real life, it's, uh, it's also, I think, it's a, it's a reasonable assum assumption to make. That uh, the 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 change in price as a function of volume is uh, is normally uh, not very large, if at all. So <coughs> we also assume homogeneous con uh, locations that the price of land, labor, and capital is independent of location. That is an easier assumption to let's say, uh, moderate and let uh, the price of land, labor, and capital be location dependent. That is manageable within this framework. So we simply end up in this, at least within this uh, rather simplistic framework, in a, uh, an optimization problem with the transport volumes, the transport costs, and the distances. The transport cost per, let's say, per kilometer, and the distance. So we try to minimize and locate in, uh, in, uh, in uh, or to locate where the sum of freighted volumes, distance-dependent transport cost, and the distance is minimized. As I said, it can be expanded, 
by taking such differences also into consideration. It's a bit harder to release this assumption because of the dependencies that, that will occur. So this is the simplest version of the Weberian tri triangle, where <coughs> we'll locate in a point within this space of uh, location of the two suppliers and the market for the final product. In a way, in the point K, where this expression on the on the previous slide is, is fulfilled, the minimization. And then <laughs> we can start playing around with some uh, some um, let's say discussion about certain elements here. And we can start with the transport cost for the supplies for these two flows here, D1 and D2, which is the supplies of the of the the factors needed for production. And I refer here to the page pages on in the in the uh, that is in, in volume two of the paper collection, where you find these uh, these descriptions uh, quite quite uh, in quite some detail. Uh, <coughs> we can discuss two different production structure for a car factory as a very intuitive and, and simple example. Uh, and uh, we can discuss two different production structures. One is producing the car with 50-50 weights of steel and plastic, whereas the other one uses or the other technology or the other firm it's uses 75-8% of steel and 25-8% of plastics. So we have the dimension of different production technologies here. And we have different transport costs for these two types of uh, production factors, steel and plastic. It costs twice as much to transport one ton of plastics as compared to one ton of steel. That could be ca caused by the volume factor. The density of steel is much higher, needs smaller volume. And uh, it, uh, plastics may also be considered as more fragile to just justify this simple differentiation where steel costs twice as much as plastic. So <coughs> when we, uh, when we uh, consider this, these two structures, these two technologies, we will find that if we do the computation of the different, uh, based on the different transport costs and the fraction of the different uh, production factors that are used in these two cases, 50-50 and 75-25, we'll find that the, the, the firm that uses steel more intensively will locate itself closer to the supplies of steel and the other way around when you talk about plastic intensive industries. And exactly where uh, then we need the num then we need numbers to calculate it. But here we have <coughs> we have um, this Weber Weberian triangle with let's say either we consider it as two different firms with different production technologies, or wh whether we consider it as one firm considering two different technologies, and they are going to make a decision of where to locate. And we have steel here and plastics here. The 50-50 <coughs> s 
steel plastics form will, will uh, locate itself here, closest to the source of plastic, and the other way around here. This is based on, let's say, a market-based solution where the industry, the company, or the two companies, depending on how you look at it, they are free to locate based on an optimization procedure. And as I mentioned on one previous lecture, this was to, to, to say, to, to, to design, let's say, if the public sector, the government, if you like, decides to not let the market allocate their resources according to such a way of thinking, you might end up in a situation where the extra costs to the society could be quite high. Uh, I mentioned the difference between the United States and the Soviet Union when it comes to location of cities <coughs> around that that should um, that are uh, kind of dependent upon a cornerstone industry, namely mining and the refinement of uh, of ore into steel. The American cities <coughs> were then located closest to the source of the very, let's say, heavy and transport demanding production factor, namely all the, all the rocks and gravel that was needed to extract the steel. So they located, let's say, close to this source. And uh, whereas in the, in the Soviet Union, the government decided based on, let's say, other criteria than this, that the cities should be located elsewhere, and hence the transport costs of getting the raw material to the, to the plant where the steel was produced became extraordinarily high. And that is one hypothesis behind why the economic development in those two countries became so different. There are many other reasons as well. But one reason was, the, was, let's say, connected to the fact that one of those countries, they had a very strong uh, fight against the market when it came to location. So we can also <coughs> discuss location in terms of not uh, so much uh, the difference in transport cost uh, and technology for the supplies, but we can consider it in terms of uh, transport cost for finished goods to the to the final location to the to the end user market to the market. Um, <coughs> and here we can also have a look at this situation where the transmission costs or the transportation costs are close to zero. And that was one good that al was also around at the time when, uh, when Weber made his theory, namely electricity. So <coughs> when, when we talk about the fact that one of the goods are almost free to, to transport, transmission costs are, are close to zero, then uh, the location will take place somewhere along the line between M1 and, and, and M2, along the, sorry, along this line. Because then, let's say if electricity is here, we'll try to locate probably quite close to that point. But 
um, when we talk about the situation where Finnish goods are uh, cost of transporting Finnish goods are greater than zero, then <coughs> we can assume that they use the same technology, the similar transport costs for the supplier, but we can consider a difference in technical efficiency. And these are only examples, or only one example, of causes of different transport costs. Because <coughs> we can, we can uh, actually just study the situation where one firm is better able to make use of the supplies than the other firm. So one of the firms has a, a poorer quality in the production process, more breakage in the production than the others, than the other. So <coughs> the firm that are best at using the, let's say, the supplies or the production factors efficiently. For them, the production, the, the transport cost to the market will matter more because they use actually less production factors to produce one unit of the finished good. So they will choose a location closer to the, to the, to the end user market. Whereas the firm that is less efficient <coughs> and which uses more supplies per unit, they would prefer to cl locate closer to the sources of the production factors. So it looks something like this. Well, this is the firm with the best, let's say, production technology. They get more out of the, of the production factors. And for them, this distance means more than for this firm, which needs to be closer to the, to the suppliers, because they are uh, simply using more supplies per produced unit. So it can be a matter of quality, or it can be a matter of choice of production technology. It can be a matter of, of uh, let's say, production efficiency. Not in terms of breakages, but, because, uh, but in terms of, let's say, having the leanest possible production structure, which needs less of the production factors. Then you are less dependent upon the the location with respect to the to the suppliers but you are more dependent on the distance to the to the final market <coughs> so so this is uh, this is uh, it's quite intuitive when you read through this uh, this uh, this chapter in the in the article collection it's it's quite logic that it works that way and uh, one can easily see real life uh, adaptations that fits well with this theory. I mentioned the uh, coal mines, steel plants issue. Uh, and I will show you within a few minutes a very small and uh, nice example of uh, Weberian location theory and practice, uh, which is taken from uh, Svalbard, up north. Have any of you been there? No. I will show you some pictures. Pictures afterwards. 
<coughs> and the final aspect of Weber is uh, then you are approaching something that you also can observe in, in, in practice. You can consider this as a map <coughs> where we have an initial location based on the simplest form of, uh, of Weberian optimization. We will locate where the sum of the transport costs uh, are, are at, at the lowest here, at k. And then <coughs> if we consider this as being in a, in a city center, where the roads are, uh, road network is very dispersed and you don't have any significant transport costs by choosing uh, choosing where to let's say where to uh, to go let's say you have a system like this with very dense road network so this could be k be many roads that's the spokes here and then we have in this situation the concentric fairly concentric at least rings like this the thing is <coughs> that you see here there are some letters here there are some numbers and the, th uh, the logic is that if transport costs, we can start with transport costs, if they are reduced in a way that the sum of, uh, of transport costs for this, uh, this location K is reduced with $10, it could be worthwhile to relocate to somewhere along this this uh, this ring, which we can call an is isodapan, means equal costs, independent on location, as long as you are located somewhere on this circle. And if you have a very dense network, it looks like this. If the dense if the network is, let's say, looks something like this. The map doesn't look like that anymore, but it looks more, more in a way, like this. So it depends on the quality of the transport network, it's the design of the transport network, how this will, uh, how this will look like. So you see, <coughs> You can go much farther further from this point and to this next isodapan if the transport network is good. You cannot go far if there is, or you cannot go anywhere at all if there is no transport network, or if the quality of the transport network is 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 uh, is low. So <coughs> the, the design of the infrastructure can affect how far you can go here. So if you build a new link, let's say in this direction, this shape will change, start here, to become something like this instead where you can, and where this area, because this is, we are talking about a map here and physical locations, this area becomes much more attractive for companies to locate themselves. And when you read this, you should be aware of that we are not talking necessarily about relocation of companies that are already located, let's say, in the city center. But we talk about location decisions. If a company is going to move to somewhere, 
this will be the perhaps on the initial location but if things are improved so that they instead can locate along this line isodapan they will prefer to do so so it's uh, it's in a way dynamic if you get a new link you cha change change the shape of these circles and new areas becomes more attractive for location but based on the same logic that the companies locate to minimize costs so so it's uh, it's in a way quite useful to think in this uh, along these lines so to speak when when we try to find out or work out what will be the, the uh, location implications of a new link like this. And I know uh, that some communities south of Oslo, let's say 100 kilometers from the central business district of Oslo, they tried to use <coughs> the location advantage that they got when they when a new dual carriageway highway was uh, was constructed from Oslo and southwards on the e western side of the Oslo fjord so they tried and they actually addressed companies in in the central Oslo and said that well come here it's uh, it's much better accessibility and in addition to that we can offer you cheaper land because the land is uh, is a scarce factor in, in in the central business district of Oslo or in the Oslo area. It's much cheaper land, uh, let's say a bit further south or north for that sake. So this number could be transport costs, but it could also be land use costs even labor costs if the if the labor costs are lower a bit outside of the city center and you could even extract this or expand this thinking to comprise international or global issues because if you think about it outsourcing decisions outsourcing of uh, production from uh, from Europe to China is also a matter of thinking about transport costs, labor costs, other factor costs, and you try to optimize location based on perhaps two or three factors, transport costs, labor costs, or transport costs, labor costs, and other suppliers, supplies in in the different locations. So this works as a cons conceptual, even if you, whether you <coughs> consider urban areas or whether you actually like to consider global location decisions. Um, yeah. what happened here okay so what is said here is uh, is more or less what I've said already but this is another way of illustrating the optimal let's say relocation or the the points in space where relocation gives the same costs as being located in the center. And uh, this is the same curves, minus 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars. Let's, it could be per produced unit, for instance. And how far do you get in the, let's say, eastbound direction? 
for a cost of minus 10. Could it depend on transport costs? Could depend on, uh, on land use costs. For 20, you get so far. 30, so far. And this may be asymmetric. This is in the westbound direction. With a slightly lower, it's, it's a slightly better, perhaps, for instance, transport network in this direction. Because you see that for $10, you can get a bit further from the city center. So this curve depends on land use, labor, transport infrastructure. And if you consider this as the central business district in a, in a, in a city, this could be eastbound, this could be westbound. So you can draw the same <coughs> curve for other directions, if you like, north, northbound, southbound. China, Europe, China, Europe, East, Europe, Brazil, West. It's possible. So we'll have a group exercise on this topic within a couple of weeks, and then perhaps we will. You can do some calculations. Uh, okay, I think uh, we'll break there before I. I continue.